hey, howdy, everybody, and thanks for joining us here again on Expanded Perspectives with me, Cam Hale, and joining me, of course, as always, is the maestro over here, Mr. Kyle Filson. How's it going, everybody? Hope y'all had a wonderful, wonderful week and weekend. For everybody that follows us on Instagram and all you elitists, everybody, they already knew this was going to happen. And for everybody else, if you're into ancient history as much as we are, you're going to enjoy what we're doing today. Especially ancient Egypt. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. This one was a fun one, folks. Everybody knows that we're junkies for it. Me and Kyle, we had to get our fix. We had uh, an amazing time and got lucky and got to interview Mr. Scott Crichton. And we are going to be discussing his book, The Secret Chamber of Osiris. Now, I always love the underparts here. Lost knowledge of the 16 pyramids. And uh, it was awesome. We had a great time chatting with him. For those of you that don't know, now, Scott is an engineer by trade. He's traveled all over the world, basically, and he's gone to tons of the ancient sites. And he's actually the host of the Alternative Egyptology Forum there on AboveTopSecret.com. And he's co-authored the book, The Giza Prophecy. He has put a lot of work into this, and I don't want to give away too much, but I will say this. You know, there's for the last, I don't know, couple hundred to, couple hundred years, it's always been thought of as a tomb. The Great Pyramid and all the pyramids have always been thought of as tombs. Well, he's kind of brought it around to where it's really not. And, of course, most all of us that are alternative historians know it's not. So he has a really interesting take on it, and it's one of those ones that, I think he's right. I think there's a lot that goes into what he says is right, especially in the book and interview. But anyway, enough beating around the bush, folks. I think you're really going to enjoy this. We had a wonderful time talking to him. And uh, let's go ahead and jump right into this interview, folks. Thank you so much for being here today. We hope we can broaden your minds and expand your perspectives. And all right, let's jump right into it. You're listening to Expanded Perspectives. And with us today is a special guest, Mr. Scott Crichton. He's wrote this fantastic book called The Secret Chamber of Osiris. He's an engineer. He's been all over the world looking at a lot of these sacred sites. And he's got some interesting stories he's going to share with us today. Scott, how are you doing? I'm good. I'm good, guys. How are you doing? We're doing well. It's raining a lot. But besides that, we're, we're doing okay. How's everything in Scotland? Um, it's a bit wet, a bit drish, as we say here in Scotland, but um, I'm sure it'll clear up in the next uh, few days. This is the longest day of the year, of course, so um, it may be raining a bit longer than usual. Man, that sounds good. Well, <laughs> I love the book, and, and it's one of my favorite subjects uh, that you get into in the book about Egypt and the pyramids, you know, and, you know, one of my favorite things, one of the new things that I had never heard of before, and you brought it out in this book that I was super excited about, is the fact that two of the great pyramids, the the pyramid of uh, Menkari and, and Khufu, are actually eight-sided pyramids, not the traditional four, that there's that line that goes through there. And you know what? I've never heard of anyone talk about that. You outline it in some of the photographs in the book. Can you tell everybody about the significance of those two pyramids and the fact that they're actually eight-sided? Yeah. Okay. Well, um, guys, th- this this was really a puzzle for me. I, I discovered that myself. Um, oh gosh, about uh, ten years ago now, some something something like that, and it was a puzzle. And I myself wondered um, why the the ancient um, builders had 
made life so much more complicated for themselves by constructing the Great Pyramid, uh, um, that's the Pyramid of Khufu, and the, the smallest of the three giant pyramids at Giza, that's G3, the Pyramid of Menkaira. You know, just, just why would they make life so much more difficult? Why not just, you see, these pyramids, the sides of these pyramids are very, very slightly indented towards the centre on each of the four sides. Um, so basically, um, you have an eight-sided pyramid, on G1 and G3. And, and it, it was a real puzzle. You know, it, it just makes no sense because the second pyramid at Giza, um, the pyramid of um, Khafra, that uh, Egyptologists call G2, that pyramid is perfect. Each side is perfectly straight. There's no slight indentation towards the centre of each face of that pyramid. So why not that one? And, and why did they do that with, with the, the other two? And this was a puzzle that, you know, or oh, my brain ticked over and mulled over and thought about for, for well, for years, really. Um, and, you know, it was the answer to that, or what I think is uh, the answer to that, it's certainly a, a possible answer to why they did that, is um, it's all to do with, um, uh, well, it's to do with geometry, it's to do with um, using the, the pyramids themselves um, to point to a specific location um, quite close um, to Giza, where I believe there is a hidden chamber, what, what I call the, the, the secret chamber of Osiris. Um, so that's what I think those, uh, what the, those indentations are. We, we call them concavities, and it's basically a... a a central line that goes up each of the the elevations of each of those two pyramids, and Egyptologists just don't know why the ancient builders, the ancient Egyptians, um, did that. So I present a theory um, in the book that um, explains those particular features and how they are used um, to actually point to a specific location just to the southwest of the, the Giza Plateau. And uh, I guess I, I love the fact also, too, and the listeners need to know this, too. When you started the book off, Scott, I love it. There's a quote that you have in there at the very beginning of the first chapter of Daniel Bornston, and it's probably one of my favorite quotes. And for those of you that don't know who Daniel was, he was the librarian of the U.S. Congress and a Pulitzer Prize winning historian. But the quote is, the greatest obstacle to discovery is not ignorance. It is the illusion of knowledge. And it holds true to this book because it, people are so set in their ways of the way we look at Egypt and, and the way that what we are kind of got this veil pulled over our eyes by Egyptologists from the past of, of what we believe is, is the true story there. And you've done the work of, of just what you've just discussed and so much more showing that there's more to it. And we've talked to a bunch of these people. There's something that you brought up in the book that. I was totally unaware of. And when I read it, I was like, whoa, it's the the first 11, the layout, let's say, of the first 11 pyramids mm -hmm. of what they actually outline. Can you tell the listeners about that? Yeah. Um, basically, um, what I've tried to do is interpret not just the Great Pyramid, as a lot of um, these books and um, alternative um, history attempt to do is just explain the Great Pyramid. I've tried to explain all the early pyramids of ancient Egypt. Now, when I say early pyramids, what I'm talking about here is there's a, a demarcation line. There are two distinct phases of pyramid building um, in ancient Egypt. There's what I call the very ancient period, and then we have the dynastic period um, of um, the ancient um, Egyptians. Now, the very ancient period is when the giant pyramids um, were built. These are like um, the 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 first what I call the first sixteen pyramids of of Egypt. That's the the giant the the the, the giant pyramids plus the the small satellite pyramids um, at Giza. Um, in total, they built about nineteen of those pyramids. 
Um, but there's three of them that were never completed, so we're, we're down to about 16. Now, the thing is, um, the ancient Egyptian um, pyramid texts, these are the most ancient religious writings that we have from anywhere in the world. And they tell us a couple of things. They tell us that the pyramid is Osiris. The construction is Osiris. It says it as, as clear as day, as plain as day, the pyramid is Osiris. It also says something rather curious. It says the pyramid is the grain. And we know that the god Osiris, he was one of the most revered gods in ancient Egypt. He was associated um, with, the, with rebirth and with agriculture. Now, the myth of Osiris tells us that his body was um, cut into 16 parts by his brother Seth. And then a switch went on in my head one day, and I thought, well, if the pyramid, if the pyramid texts are telling us that the pyramid is Osiris, and the myth of Osiris tells us that um, Osiris' um, body was cut into 16 parts, does that mean that there are 16 pyramids or 16 pieces of Osiris scattered across the land of Egypt, as the myth of Osiris tells us? So what I did then was I, I um, took um, uh, my faithful Google Earth and I uh, got a map of um, Egypt and I plotted um, the first 16 pyramids. That includes the small satellite pyramids at um, Giza. And essentially you have um, 11 of these um, giant pyramids, the giant pyramids. And when you plot those onto this map and then you join the lines what you end up with is on the ground is um, a, a drawing of what is essentially the, the, the classic effigy or the classic figurine of Osiris that we see in all the ancient Egyptian drawings. You know, Osiris usually standing with his arms crossed with the, the crook and flail in, in each hand with the, the, the distinctive um, three-pronged atif crown. You have a representation of that figure on the ground at Giza. You know, so I'm thinking, well, maybe that is essentially where um, the, the myth of Osiris stems from. It stems from the fact that the pyramid literally is Osiris and um, it is his body on the ground in 16 pieces scattered across um, the west bank of the Nile, just as the, the ancient Plutarch's myth of Osiris tells us. So that was that was you know I never expected to to find that when 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 I looked at the first these first pyramids but there there it was and and in, in context of the mythology um, of what we are told that's been passed down to us it, it makes perfect sense of the mythology and of the the ancient um, pyramid texts that have been passed down to us that the pyramid is Osiris. And that Osiris is the grain, because this goes back to the the reason why the the very ancient builders constructed these first sixteen pyramids in the the form or what would become the form or the body of Osiris on the west bank of the Nile. And it's one of those. It was kind of hidden right in front of all of us this whole time, and you yep. just it just kind of dawned on you're like, wait a second. And I guess that was something else too that that. There's a lot of it that you allude to in the books, and it's great is the way you talk about the way you kind of – it just dawned on you like an epiphany. All of a sudden, you're like, oh, wait. And it's funny how sometimes when you distance yourself and take a little time away from subjects, they seem to find their – kind of ooze back into you, and you start thinking about it. You're like, oh, okay, I got it. I guess one of them is centroid mathematics is the is the way you looked at the layout. Now is you kind of put all these pyramids under more of a microscope and then found something else. Yeah. Um, well, you know, without, um, you know, going too deep into uh, math or geometry, because it really isn't um, that, you know, deep at all. Um, centroid mathematics is um, very, very simple. And, and it started for me with, um, I was reading um, um, uh, Jockham's, um, some of uh, Jockham's work, and um, he, he related a tale about um, the Jedi, um, who was a... a um, 
priest of uh, Khufu who um, try, Khufu wanted to know where the, the secret chambers um, of Osiris um, were hidden and um, he wanted the keys and um, the Jedi told Khufu that it would be the keys would be found by um, three kings or, 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 or three three men or th- three kings and this um, you know sort of resonated with me it's it, it sort of like well what does that mean it's obviously it's obviously some kind of um, hidden meaning there and um, I thought well what are these three kings are actually the three pharaohs that are, are attributed to the three pyramids in essence what then perhaps the Jedi meant that you know the the secret chamber would be found by the three pyramids um, at Giza, and so that for me um, the answer. And I was trying to find a way. Well, okay, if it's the three pyramids at Giza that are pointing somehow to this secret chamber, how could they actually do that? How could you take three objects that are spaced in a particular manner and get them to work in a unique way to point to a very specific, unique location? And it took me months, years. And uh, one day, my my, my son, um, uh, Jamie, he was was working on a, a, a math math project and he just asked me very innocently dad how do you how do you find the the, the center of a triangle and it was just a question that that simple and i and i started to explain well unlike a circle which has one center unlike a square which has one center a rectangle has one center a triangle can actually have thousands of different ways of plotting essentially the a, a center it doesn't have a single centre. Now, in the ancient world, I think at the moment, uh, in our current um, mathematical knowledge, we know something like there's over 5,000 different ways of plotting a different centre within a triangle. But in the ancient world, they knew only of three of these different ways of, of plotting um, a centre. And the, the, the thing about um, the centroid geometry is that it ties in with... The, the concavities of G1 and G3, which, um, you know, the, the, the centroid um, geometry. And using the concavities um, and the centroid geometry, we can reverse engineer effectively a triangle, a unique triangle around the three Giza pyramids, which point to the apex of that triangle that we reverse engineer around those three pyramids. Um, essentially points to a unique location to the southwest of the Giza Plateau. And that's where in 2008 um, I basically went out on a trip to Egypt to try and get to that location. That uh, I'm so... It was my son. It was down to my son. You know, he just he just asked that innocent question and then the light just went on, you know, and that was <laughs> that was that was the epiphany. That, that, that's And that's what we were talking about. That's so great is it's one of those things that Little things that you never know, but you got to stay open minded. You got to be looking at it. And yet again, this was something that was right in front of all of us this whole time. And it just kind of clicked like it was it's almost like it was meant to be. There's somebody else I want to talk to you about. Uh, (laughs) If we can all discuss this guy without without cursing uh, and really being too too hard on the fella, I'm sure it's what I, I call him the man with three first names. But and it's just simply because I do not like the way he used to do things as far as a lot of his, uh, uh, I guess you could say, excavation work and things. Mm -hmm. It's Colonel Richard William Howard Weiss. This is the man that solely, I believe, is solely responsible for all the misinterpretation and the trouble that we have where where Egyptology and what people refer to as alternative history, which is really not. It's more of the the true form of what's going on in my opinion. But this mm-hmm. seems to be the man that's kind of solely responsible for the troubles there with his, his exploits. And even in the book, you've, you've discussed about him gun pattering doors open and things <laughs> in the great pyramid. You're like, I, I, I wish oh, it's, I can't say what I wish, but yeah, uh, I guess we need to talk about that guy and what has been alleged upon him and what seems to be what he had done before we go yeah. on any further, really. 
Yeah, okay. Um, well, Colonel, Colonel Vice, um, um, one of the reasons why I, I've included this chapter of Colonel Vice in the book um, is because um, the, the book, um, I, say, I, I present a theory in the book which shows that um, the Great Pyramids aren't four and a half thousand years old as the Egyptologists tell us. They aren't even ten and a half or eleven and a half thousand years old as Baval and, and Hancock tell us. They're much, much older than that. Um, I show I present the theory in the book which shows how um, the, the, the these great pyramids are actually around about nineteen thousand years old. Now that presented obviously a problem because inside the Great Pyramid, um, Colonel Vice in eighteen thirty seven discovered the these, these um, um, painted, red painted markings, which Egyptologists call uh, quarry marks, basically uh, the, the the gangs at the quarries when they were hewing out these gigantic blocks of stone, of limestone blocks, would paint their their, their crew names with with. On, with red paint, red ochre paint onto these blocks, and then they would be carted off um, to to be um, placed within the, the construction of the Great Pyramid. So that that is the the orthodox theory of how these markings came to be in these chambers inside the Great Pyramid. There's these five chambers um, above the King's Chamber of the Great Pyramid, which had. Um, no one. Well, Nathaniel Davidson discovered the the first one of those. I think in about 1767, some, something like that. It was it was about 70 years before Vice um, discovered the the next chamber above Davison's. Now, the thing about Davison, when he discovered the first of these chambers um, in 1767, whenever um, there was no markings, no painted markings at all. And this is the thing about the Great Pyramid, about all these early giant pyramids, there are no markings inside them whatsoever. They are completely, utterly anonymous structures, which is completely the reverse of what we find in the later pyramids. The later, um, you know, we, if we go across the demarcation line where we get find the, the smaller, inferior pyramids that the, the later dynastic Egyptians built, um, you know, they have um, pyramid text in them, they have um, other um, drawings and things inside them, as do their Mustaba tombs, as do their underground um, tombs or rock cut tombs, have all these fantastic paintings on the walls and so forth and so on. The pyramids, the giant pyramids, the first pyramids that were built by the very ancient Egyptians are completely devoid of all of this for, and, you know, for good reason, because they were, they were not religious um, edifices at all. They were purely perfunctory um, constructions built for, um, you know, um, what I call Project Osiris, which we may touch on later. But anyway, Howard Vice um, opened the next chamber um, above Davison's chamber, which is called Wellington's chamber. And he found um, some markings in there and then he went up, blasted his way using gunpowder up the next level. He found another hidden chamber there, which he named Nelson's Chamber. A few marks in there were found. And then above that, Lady Arbuthnot's Chamber, where he found a whole lot of um, painted quarry marks. And then the final chamber above Lady Arbuthnot's Chamber was Campbell's, what he named Campbell's Chamber. And in there he found um, all sorts of um, markings again. Now, among these markings were the cartouche of um, Sufis, or that's the, the Greek name, or one of the Greek names for the pharaoh Khufu, whom he, Egyptologists tell us um, built the Great Pyramid. So that seems quite fortuitous that, um, you know, they the knew that um, Sufis or was alleged to have built it through the writings of um, um, Herodotus and so forth and Manetho that um, Khufu or Sufis had built this structure and there we find a cartouche in there which belongs to Sufis. I find that fortuitous but at the same time Egyptologists dated um, Khufu or this cartouche um, just by knowing the, the, the king list and that they had built up of which you know there's hundreds of kings missing from but anyway they date this uh, Sufis Khufu cartouche to around 2500 BC which as you can see presented something of a problem to me if I'm saying well wait a minute 
these structures are actually 19,000 years old um, because this this um, marking, this cartouche, if it's in a sealed chamber, it has to be original. So I investigated the matter and I know that um, the, the international author, best-selling author, Zechariah Sitchin, he was the first guy to um, suggest um, or even claim that um, Howard Weiss himself um, forged these markings forced the cartouche inside these chambers and he presented some proof in his book um, I think it was The Stairway to Heaven in 1980 and um, but unfortunately for Sitchin he hadn't actually seen the the cartouche in Campbell's chamber himself he'd never actually seen it personally, he'd never even seen a photograph of it and he went off half cocked, got it all wrong totally muddied the waters and was very, his, his claims there were very swiftly debunked. And I think quite rightly so because he had made a genuine mistake. It was sloppy research. He should have checked his facts better in that regard. But that aside, Sitchin still raised a number of very good points which haven't yet been reasonably explained today by Egyptologists. But anyway, I digress. What I did was Part, part of the thing that Sitchin presented was a letter from a guy called Walter Allen who lived who lived in um, Pittsburgh in Pennsylvania. He was researching his family, his family origins in, in 1954. And he was a radio um, ham enthusiast, ham radio enthusiast. And um, in this, um, when he was doing his research, he was speaking to various family elders and he uh, spoke to them. And one of the things he discovered was that his great grandfather, a chap called Humphreys Brewer, had actually worked with Howard Weiss in 1837 at the Great Pyramid. And one of the, the things that um, Humphreys Brewer passed down in which Walter Allen wrote in his ham radio logbook when he was discussing this with his, his family, um, was that um, a couple of Vice's assistants were painting marks inside the pyramids. They were taking red ochre paint, which was still available in 1837, this ancient paint, and they were painting their own marks inside the Great Pyramid. And Humphreys Brewer took great exception to this, um, complained about it to to Colonel Weiss and was promptly kicked off the site for his trouble. So um, there are questions about that because the problem with the story um, is that when you read the official account that Howard Weiss um, printed or published in 1840 in his book Operations Carried Out at Giza. There's, it's done in three volumes. There's no mention of this guy Brewer, Humphreys Brewer, anywhere in the three volumes. Now, I can understand why he wouldn't be um, <laughs> mentioned. <laughs> right. Yeah, I can really get my head around that one, no problem. Um, you know, if you're accusing a guy and his team of um, perpetrating a fraud inside the Great Pyramid, it's hardly likely, especially if you're just a young 19, 20-year-old civil engineer, um, just at the start of your career, you, you know, you, you're a non-entity really as far as Colonel Vice is concerned, and so your views count for nothing, and um, you, he's basically going to be expunged um, it becomes persona non grata as far as Howard Weiss is concerned and totally written out of his official account in his published book. So it occurred to me that, um, well, wait a minute, that might be the case in his, his um, published book, but um, his field notes must exist somewhere. His official handwritten field notes must exist somewhere. So I scurried about and researched a bit and eventually I managed to find that they were located, his actual field notes, his handwritten field notes were located in a small archive centre down in Aylesbury, which is just outside the north, uh, north of London. And uh, so my wife Louise and I, we went down um, we drove down, it was about an 800 mile round trip. We drove down, spent a few days um, down there in the in the, the archive centre, photographing something in the order of 600 odd pages. You know, these are full scat pages, um, double sided. And 
you know, it, it was a big, big job. But anyway, we man, we managed to do it. We found his his field notes, managed to um, photograph them, and my goodness, what we discovered in those field notes. Um, well, as you know, it's it, it's in the book, um, which basically proves that um, how advice. Um, you know, we have this eyewitness account which um, tells us that, um, you know, something dodgy was happening. Well, Howard Weiss's own notes, his own f- handwritten field notes pretty much confirms that. He pretty much, you're right, it, yeah. t- he tells on himself yeah. w- without yeah. meaning to. It's, yeah, exactly. It's, it's, right, it's right there in his notes. That's one of the greatest stories to me ever is, is that story that you uncovered right there of the whole thing. As much as I love the book and and all of this, that story to me means more than anything because it lets you know that people were, sometimes people get this romantic idea of explorers and, and, and and these men and back in the day and that they were way more, uh, I guess, morally just and, and courageous and things than anything that goes on today. But that's just not true. You do find out that they are just like we were. And that well, if you, money talks. If, yeah, if you look at um, the, the 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 history of um, uh, Howard Weiss, you know, you go back to um, you know his his early career when he was a politician. You know, I mean, that guy <laughs> um, totally bribed his way into um, into power, into becoming a member of parliament for for the UK Parliament. Um, he bought something like nine hundred and thirty two votes, which contravened. You know so many laws in in the UK um, at that time. You know the anti-corruption laws and in, in during elections, and it was even it was even brought up. You know that the, one of the other contestants during that election um, took it to the UK Parliament to protest, and um, unfortunately it wasn't um, the protest wasn't upheld because they didn't have the, the guy. Philip Staple, who was protesting, he didn't have the the, the evidence, but the evidence um, came came later. Um, I think in 1869, a few a number of years after Vice's death, that yeah, he did, <laughs> he did do this, yeah. he did buy all these votes, but the evidence only came out long after Howard Vice's death. So that th- this is actually um, touches on uh, my new book, which is um, the it's called uh, Great Pyramid Hoax. The evidence, and this is the one that, that I'm actually, I've actually just sent it off to um, um, Inner Traditions Bearing Co. So that'll be out probably, um, I think December 2016, something like that. And there's a pile of evidence in the new book. There's yeah, there's some in, in uh, the Secret Chamber of Osiris, but I think in the new book I've got something like 14 or 15 different pieces of evidence which point to um, this this fraud, this hoax having um, occurred inside the Great Pyramid in 1837. I was just about to say that that could be a book all in itself, and then now here you go talking about it. It is going to be a book Yeah, all I can't in wait itself. to read that. I mean, it's amazing. Like Cam was saying, it's the greatest story told. It's probably the greatest story that mankind hasn't been told. I mean, the fact that we're still taught today and that Egyptologists are clinging on to this idea that the Great Pyramids are only 4,000 years old, despite... All the things that Mr. Vice did, despite all this evidence that shows that they're they're far older. I mean, there's other structures on the Giza Plateau that you can tell were built on an ancient structure but prior to that. Yeah. And there's so many things, and you outline them even in your book, about the differences in the shape of the pyramids. Mm-hmm. The three major mm-hmm. ones, G1, 2, and 3, compared to the other Mastaba tones and how the, yep. how the architecture was different. Why were these square when all the other mm-hmm. architecture in the area is like rectangular? You, yeah. you show, you outline in there, um, not just the shape, but the size of the things. And also, like, the security. That's one of my favorite parts. Mm. These things were not a tomb. And if they yeah. were a tomb, why would they go through all these efforts to make it, to, like, show you how to get access inside the pyramids? Not only that, there's other things outside that it's almost like, a, a, like a schematics, map. right? Like trail passageways, schematics, yeah. a map, like, exactly, showing you how to gain access to these tombs. Yet we hold on to this idea that that's what they were, that they were tombs. And if they were not tombs, what is it, Scott, that you can tell the people that you think that these great pyramids really were? 
Well, they're definitely not tombs, um, although I think, um, to be fair to Egyptologists and um, to um, the historians um, that tell us they were, is that I think, as I said, I talk about this demarcation line, this historical demarcation line, um, the, the early giant pyramids definitely were not tombs. Um, but I think the, the later, smaller, inferior pyramids um, perhaps um, were um, built, built as tombs. And I think this is why we, we are receiving mixed messages um, from some of the, the earliest historians. Like the ancient um, texts that have come down to us, the, the Arabic, Arabic texts um, tell us that um, you know, the, the pyramids, something happened in ancient Egypt thousands and thousands of years ago. The stars in the sky suddenly, without warning, moved away from their normal course. Yeah, so so the, the king, um, Sirid, he asked um, his astronomer priest, what does this mean? And the, the astronomer priest basically said, well, in 300 years, there's going to be um, a massive deluge which will drown the entire kingdom. And after that, there'll be a conflagration, a, a fire, a drought, a severe drought. And so the king, when he heard this, um, said, right, OK, what we're going to do is to build um, pyramids. And inside these pyramids, we're going to store everything that the, the civilization or kingdom or country will need um, to restart, to, to reboot our civilization. And we, so inside these structures, they would put everything like, you know, uh, grain, barley, wheat, all sorts of seed types. They would put tools, they would put um, civilizing knowledge on the inside and the outside, um, you know, all manner of things they would put inside um, um, these um, structures in order for the kingdom to um, reboot itself. Now, this isn't me just, um, you know, speculating this. This is this is one of the, the, the purposes of the pyramids that has actually been passed down to us, but it's one that is largely ignored um, by the Egyptologists, because they just see the the pyramids of Egypt as one continuous um, stream, one continuous legacy um, of you know. Well, if these later ones were built as tombs, then the ones further back, you know, the back project what they know about the much much later um, culture and much much later civilization. The back project that onto a much, much earlier civilization of which they know virtually nothing about. And this is what's going on, you know. But these later ones and the, the you know, the, the dynastic um, period pyramids, as I call them, um, they would have, be, you know, been built when the, the, the pyramids basically became a religion. Um, you know, when the first pyramids were built, to store grain and all these different seed types and tools and all sorts of other things. You know, this saved the kingdom. This allowed the kingdom to be reborn. This is why, you know, the, the Ben Ben stone, I don't know if you're familiar with the Ben Ben stone. It's, it's basically what the, the apex of the capstone of the pyramid. And symbolically, it is associated with the Bennu bird in Egypt, which is or rather which has um, the similar properties to the phoenix whereby it can rise from the ashes of its own destruction and this is you know totally encapsulated in the the, the symbology um, of the the pyramid that's what they were about they were about the rebirth of the kingdom not the rebirth of the king that came later when the the whole concept had become a religion much much later in ancient Egyptian um, civilization. And that is when, you know, the, the Osiris religion um, rose because these first pyramids were Osiris. Um, you know, the, the body of Osiris, quite literally 16 parts of it, lying across the land of Egypt, filled with grain. And what we find later, the later culture of, of ancient Egypt doing, we, we find them creating um, what are called um, corn mummies during the festival of the Osiris festival of Koak. And inside these corn mummies, these were effigies of Osiris, the god Osiris. And inside these, they would, they would, they would place grain 
inside these corn mummies and we'd bury them in the ground. You know, so this, what you have is a corn mummy of Osiris filled with grain. And that's essentially, you know, mirroring um, or uh, reflecting what the pyramids were. The first 16 pyramids were the body of Osiris filled with grain. It's just taking that idea and just, you know, um, celebrating it, commemorating it in, in a ritualistic um, form in the much later um, dynasties. And what they would also, another part of this festival of Koak is um, they would have um, these small um, rectangular boxes, um, some made of stone, some made of wood, and they would only be about 20 inches long by maybe about five or six inches wide. And these would be filled with earth and they would sprinkle um, grain in, on top of the earth. This symbolised, this was a chthonic ritual. It symbolised the rebirth of the earth. And that's what the first pyramids were all about. It's about the rebirth of the earth, the kingdom, not the king. That would come later. This is what it was. They believed their kingdom was in peril. And that's why they built these first 16 pyramids. Now, this box of earth... They would, these small boxes, we call them Osiris bricks. And what they would do is they'd bury them in the ground and they'd place a large rock on top of it, symbolising the primeval mound. This is a primeval mound that apparently rose out of the floodwaters of the creation um, and became the first land above the floodwaters. And out of this, this primeval mound, this pyramid, Everything in creation came out of it and, you know, basically um, created the world and, and, and everything else. So this is the mythology, this is the symbology, and this is what I try to do in the book, is to try to connect all these dots, these different stories, the pyramid texts, the myth of Osiris, the pyramids, the grain, the Osiris beds, the Osiris bricks. You know, I try to, the, the corn mummies, I try to create you know, a cohesive narrative for all of this stuff. And that I, 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 is what I hope to do. And I think um, it, it makes sense to me. When you look inside um, the second pyramid, for example, at Giza, um, Giovanni Belzoni in 1818, he was the first modern explorer to get into that pyramid. And inside um, the, the main chamber of that, I don't call it a burial chamber, I call it the main chamber of that pyramid, he found the stone box, what Egyptologists call a sarcophagus, I actually call it nebank, because the ancient Egyptians had two different words. They did a word for a stone box, and they did another word for a stone box, which kind of doesn't make sense, but it does in my theory, because these weren't, these stone boxes weren't sarcophagi at all. They were nebank, they were boxes filled with earth because this was a chthonic ritual about the rebirth of the earth. And inside that pyramid, when Belzoni opened the stone box in the pyramid of Kafra in 1818, he found it filled with earth. You know, mm -hmm. so Egyptologists, they say, oh, well, um, well, how can we explain this one? You know, and... <laughs> They make up all sorts of silly stuff. Oh, well, you know, um, the king's body gets stolen and they decided to fill it with, go to really, really extensive trouble to fill it all with earth. You know, I'm saying, no, the best way to explain this is that it's actually all part of the same thing. You know, the, the small boxes that they were burying, of earth that they were burying in later dynasties, you know, uh, these are basically replicating the 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 earlier tradition. That, you know what these pyramids were all about. Um, this stone box and filled with earth in G two was the archetype nebank, which the later cultures were basically um, celebrating in this ritual, this festival of Koak. You know, so all points to the fact that these pyramids were built as as a what I call a project Osiris. It was a, a national recovery system they were building, a bit like what we have done ourselves today with, um, you know, the Spalbard Global Seed Vault um, up in the, the Arctic Circle, mm -hmm. which opened, I think, in 2008. We have placed every conceivable seed 
anywhere in the world, from everywhere in the world, <laughs> inside that vault. And we done we did that in case anything, you know, any major disaster occurs to the Earth, so that we can reseed the planet should um, something major happen. The ancient Egyptians believed their kingdom, you know, there was going to be a great deluge that was going to wipe their civilization clean off the face of the earth. And they built these structures to withstand. They, they built them, and they built them so high that you could see them for, from like, you know, 50, 60, 70 miles away, so they could be easily found. You're not going to build these vaults, these these um, recovery vaults, these chambers into a natural mountain. You're not going to do that because if you build them deep into a natural mountain, how are you going to find them? Right. They wanted them to stand out. Yeah, you need them to stand out in the in the, the the natural environment as unnatural mountains or man-made mountains. They stand out in the natural envir- environment. They're easy to find. They needed to be easy to find because they needed to you know get these chambers open and get you know the, their kingdom reseeded you know in, in good time to 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 basically well you know have their civilization rebooted again. You know so. That's what they needed to do. That's why they built them so strong to withstand the deluge. That's why they built them so high so that they could be d- discovered easily. But these are these are exactly the you know, is that what you're going to do for a king? You're going to build a massive um, structure that can be seen by every tomb tomb raider in the land from seventy miles away? No, you're absolutely not going to do that. And, and not to mention the fact that there was nothing inside of them. To, to as much as the the later Egyptian kings would mark up everything with their likenesses, there was really well, exactly. nothing inside there to, to to base anything on. And I like how even in the book you discuss, I believe it's the inventory steel or whatnot. The the book, the writings that the Egyptians had that discuss the upkeep that they themselves did on the existing pyramids. Yeah, that's right. Um, you know, the ancient Egyptians tell us themselves that their civilization is, I think, something like 40,000 years old. That's what they tell us. I'm not just saying the pyramids are 19,000 years old. The ancient Egyptians themselves tell us their civilization is around 40,000 years old. You know, so if you've got these these um, structures by the time um, of the early dynastic period um, where, where Khufu's around and Khafre's around, you know, these guys are basically repairing structures that are already ancient in their time. You know, so this is why you, you find on the inventory stela, Khufu is making all sorts of repairs at Giza. You know, so mm-hmm. this, this, you know, the, again, the Egyptologists they dismiss the inventory stela because it doesn't fit their narrative. You yeah. know that oh no, oh no, these 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 structures, this can't be right. You know, um, um, these these structures are only you know four and a half thousand years old. They were built in the time of Khufu, but you know the evidence is there that you know it's it's just wrong. And yeah, they do all these um, radiocarbon dating um, tests. I think um, two two studies have been made of the the early pyramids. And uh, the, the, they've dated them to, to, to various um, dates, roughly, I think the oldest carbon date they got was about 3,200 BC from the Great Pyramid. But, you know, even Dr. Hawass doesn't trust carbon dating. He's gone on record as saying, you know, it's useless. You know, it just doesn't help. He's gone on record as saying radiocarbon dating will never help archaeology and you know, I think he said five thousand years. It'll never help archaeology. <laughs> it's useless. In in archaeology, we call radiocarbon dating imaginary dates. That's what Hawass, Doctor Hawass himself, said about radiocarbon dating. And he's a guy that should know because he's probably sent more artifacts to to labs across the world to be radiocarbon dated than anyone alive. And you know, he's probably got the dates back from the the radiocarbon labs and they just don't do not match the the archaeological um dating that that, that that they can do you know so the, you know he's a guy that would know if um, radiocarbon exactly. dating works and there's all sorts of problems with radiocarbon um dating but uh, you know i mean we could spend uh, spend a whole show <laughs> and then some you know uh, just discussing that that topic alone but um you know 
This this basically is um, you know my my position as I believe the structures are nineteen thousand years old. Um, they were built by um, the very ancient Egyptians, and you know the the dynastic Egyptians basically inherited them. By this time, you know the pyramids had you know the whole concept, the the creation story that the pyramids um, were about. You know this the. You know, this is what created the ancient Egyptian creation creation story about the pyramid rising out of the floodwaters, you know, in Khufu's time, because that's literally what they believed. You know, that's the reason why they were built. And so they believed that, you know, and so, you know, Khufu and Khafra and Minkaura, they're, they're essentially repairing um, these structures, as was um, Snefru. You know, Snefru, if you look at the, the pyramid of um, Meidum, you know, that that's a really unusual pyramid because, you know, the original builders who built it, built it on solid bedrock. The core of that pyramid, which the core of it is, is actually a step pyramid. And then apparently Snefru converted it into a true pyramid um, with, you know, perfectly smooth sides. But the thing is, Snefru, Snefru, Snefru was Khufu's father who built actually four pyramids. Well, why do you need four pyramids if you've only got, for burial, if you've only got one body? You know, so there's all these contradictions in, in you know, the, the, the mainstream um, view of these structures, which just does not explain. But if, 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 you're, if you're a builder, you know, and you're, you're wanting to build as many recovery vaults as you can in 300 years, then that explains why one guy could build three, four, five, Five, ten of these structures, but anyway, um, we have um, Snefru building this core pyramid, the step, or rather converting this um, step pyramid, what was a step pyramid built in solid bedrock. But Snefru, who hasn't a clue how to build a pyramid, builds his conversion on sand, you know, and it collapses shortly after, you know, um, you know he he completes it, you know. So that shows you right there that we have. Two completely different builders, sets of builders, people from a much more ancient time that knew what they were doing, and then that knowledge got lost after this this um, cataclysm. It, it got lost, and you know the the Egyptian civilization essentially went into a, a dark age, if you like, and the knowledge um, was lost. And by the time, you know, um, Khufu and Snefru and the Fourth Dynasty, so forth, um, they were basically trying to um, repair um, these um, already ancient structures and probably not making um, too great a job of it. <laughs> it. Well, everything that you have found, it points to... It's not just what you found to point to that date, but there's a lot of other people seem to have found things that, and especially with the finding of Gobekli Tepe and then whatever they're going oh, yeah. to uncover at Guyong Padang, there's no telling what, but it seems like it does point back to exactly what you're saying is a much, much older civilization. Now, I got to ask you one other thing before we wrap this puppy <laughs> up. I've, there's There's something that it sounds to me like we're talking to an Egyptian person of Egyptian heritage themselves from Scotland, because it sounds like there is a tie there from what you were saying. And I've heard it from other people. Can you explain that? So people don't think I'm just going crazy saying these words. <laughs> um, well, um, when I went out, um, to, to Egypt, um, I was trying to get to this, this, um, secret chamber this is the the 17th part of osiris's body you know there's there's all these these there's these parts of osiris body which his wife isis was searching for and she found all of them except one part and this part i believe is the part which holds you know the was part of the recovery system the project osiris which the head they had to hide this Part. It couldn't be one of the giant pyramids which are easily seen and easily found. This part, which is pointed to by the centroid um, geometry, is hidden away to the southwest um, of of uh, the Giza Plateau, and it probably contains all of the high wisdom, the high knowledge of this, um, you know, very ancient Egyptian civilization, um, which I believe um, genuinely existed. Now, when I try to get to that um, um, location that I had identified, 
I found I was walking through the the Giza Plateau, heading um, in the southwest direction, and then eventually my path was blocked by this. Um, it's called Hawass's Wall, and basically it's a it's a thirteen foot wire fence. Some of it's wire, some of it's actually a physical brick wall. Um, and there's all these um, guard turrets and so forth and so on. You can see dotted around. And um, I was, I had to, the, the the spot that I wanted to get to, um, the apex of this um, centroid triangle, which I'd mapped over the, the um, three Great Giza pyramids, um, was just about uh, 200, 200 yards away, just over the crest of a hill. But I had to get over this fence. And um, I tried, I tried climbing it. And um, I heard this almighty noise behind me, and it was a, a camel. And on top of the camel was one of the antiquities guards, and um, he was just shaking his head. <laughs> what are you doing? <laughs> and so um, <laughs> I, uh, I basically got myself down off the fence. He's, he asked, where are you from? He says, I'm American. I went, no, I shook my head, I went, no, no. Um, um, Scottish, I'm from Scotland and I said and I just thought about that for a moment he says, from Scotland you're Egyptian brother <laughs> because there's this um, ancient legend that they're still taught in um, Egypt to this day that um, um, the the daughter of the pharaoh Akhenaten um, Princess Meritus or Skota as um, she's also known, um, discovered um, Skota or Scotland um, you know, thousands of years ago, and this is what they're taught um, in Egypt. And funnily enough, in some places in, in Scotland, we're we're also um, taught that. And there's a very good book by um, um, Egyptologist, a uh, badge carrying Egyptologist, um, Lorraine Evans, um, called Kingdom of the Ark, and she explores that um, idea as well. It's a very good book which explores the the ancient links between Egypt. Ireland and um, Scotland. So yeah, um, because of that connection, I just I just got a slight rebuke from the the guard and told to be on my way. But otherwise, I think um, I might have been facing um, a slightly more daunting prospect. <laughs> I like how he instantly blames us, blames <laughs> Americans. He's like, "Oh, so you're American." <laughs> Like, no, I'm well, Scottish. Right. <laughs> he did use it. Well, I, I can only imagine, um, guys. I can only imagine that that is because there's more American visitors um, to to Giza than probably any other nationality. Probably, yeah, yeah. So, but yeah, that that kind of got me out of that scrape. So I was I was um, very thankful for my um, Scottish Egyptian heritage. <laughs> mm. I love that. I lo- I hopefully one day. We'll get you, and now that you've finally turned in the other book and it'll be ready, jump into that. I, I would love, <laughs> that is a story all in itself, because we've heard both ways. We've heard that where the Egyptians found Scotland, and we've heard where the Scottish are actually the first Egyptians. So we've heard some different different lines coming from different people, so I hopefully yeah. somebody will pick it up and run with that one. Yeah. I mean, even in Scotland today, we call um, the, the top of a mountain, or the peak or the apex of a mountain, we call it a ben as in like Ben Nevis, Ben Lomond, um, you may have heard of these. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's what the ancient Egyptians called the, the top of a pyramid, a Ben. If you start looking at the yeah the phonetic <laughs> right? the, the lineage there of different terms and, and some yeah. of the, the language, there's going to be some ties. There's going to be something that, that links them together pretty yeah, hard. The, the ancient Egyptians were the first to wear the kilt and play bagpipes. There you go. Nice. Nice. Well, thank you so much for coming on today, Scott. What an amazing book. Do you have a website or anything you'd like to plug? Um, well, uh, just just really my my own website, um, guys. There's a lot of um, information on there, a lot of photographs, a lot of articles, a lot of presentations. Um, I have a couple more that I'll be uploading in the next um, week or so. That's uh, my uh, www.scottcrichton, that's all the one word, .co.uk. Awesome. That'll be perfect. And when your other book comes out, we're definitely going to have to have you come on and talk about Vice and everybody some more. Oh, I would love to. Absolutely. Thanks a lot, Scott. Cheers, guys. It's been a pleasure speaking to you.
And we're back with Expanded Perspectives. Interesting interview. I love Scott Crichton. I love his book. I love his idea. It's crazy to me that, you know, it's been right there staring us in the face, but just nobody ever noticed it before. A lot of the things is, you know, like you were talking about before we got into the interview, is how, you know, we were always taught that they were that the Great Pyramids were giant tombs mm-hmm. for the pharaohs. Mm-hmm. But there's not really any significant evidence that shows that. No. And, you know, what Scott suggests is that the these 16 pyramids of ancient Egypt were not these royal tombs, but in fact were indestructible recovery vaults designed to revive a civilization after an anticipated catastrophe, mm-hmm. which they called the, what is it, the Deluge of Toth. Of Toth, yeah. Which they knew there was a great flood coming. They built these vaults. They stored things in it, different ones, different things, grain, seeds, you mm-hmm. know, like the seed, seed banks, banks, books on knowledge, uh, so that, and it would be clear, because, you know, they they found other pharaohs' tombs in ancient Egypt that you can tell that they didn't want people to find them. So they, you know, they had all kinds of safeguards to protect thieve, grave robbers and thieves. But that's not the way these pyramids are. The pyramids stand out. I mean, if you're looking across the, the Nile Valley, they stand out for miles. Yeah. And they're purposely set up to let people in. It's because they wanted to help out civilization. It's a really good thought. It's like a time capsule. Mm-hmm. We always talk about it. When you're in school, a lot of kids, as a class, you'll bury a time capsule. And then I remember, I remember digging up a time capsule that was buried like in the 60s. And it was really cool, but this is a way, you know, we have a seed bank. I think it's in Sweden or Switzerland mm-hmm. or something. I mean, it's, but this is a thing, you know, and this is what the end of the world, everybody's always prophesizing, you know, if <laughs> a- astronomers or something had seen a giant asteroid coming towards the earth and they know there was nothing we could do, I believe that we would do a, something similar and try to, to say, anyway. look, yeah. a lot of humanity is about to be wiped out. It's at least put together some kind of safeguard something for if anyone is able to survive the catastrophe they could rebuild their civilization and i think that's exactly what happened here well what's funny is you and i have discussed this not that we came up with what he come up with and all that but you and i've kicked around probably 10 years ago uh the, uh, what if it was a time capsule you know like, what what if there was stuff stored in it and it just got taken out like looted over time and then and then i remember we never thought much about it because we got into more and more of the ancient history and really went to studying and looking at it being built much, much older. And then the stuff that Scott brings out, I'm like, he's right. That dude, it just feels right. It just it feels, feels right. Right. Yeah, it does. It just, you're kind of like, man, he makes a lot of sense. A lot of sense with the stuff that he talks about. The book, also the secret chamber. That's another thing that I wish uh, you can't get to. I mean, it really does seem, I mean, it's there. You just can't get to it. I That's mean, right. It's, yep. There's so much more. I, I, I hope. I hope Scott continues and, and keeps going. And like we said, he's he's going to be discussing and, and doing another book on Mr. Vice, and that'll be a that'll be a good one. You'll get to see what kind of, I guess, what kind of debauchery Willie went on uh, during the the study of the the Urge, uh, Urge, <laughs> early studies of Egyptology. Yeah. So, and I had a great time. It was awesome. It's a fantastic I book. It. I suggest anyone pick it up. I'll put show notes and links to it in the show notes. It's the Secret Chamber of Osiris: Lost Knowledge of the Sixteen Pyramids. The author is once again Scott Crichton. Fantastic book, especially if you're into that type of thing. Uh, Cam, what else we got going on, man? <sighs> just busy. I don't know, man. I would love to be able to tell everybody what I'm doing on the Elite Show, but I'm not even sure. Just it's top yet. secret. That's right. It's top, top secret. You secret. have to sign up to find out. Congrats to the U.S. Women's Soccer Team. Yes, World that Cup was, champions. That was a really good. And congrats is a, a, a must to all of our Irish fans uh, for Mr. Conor McGregor. Great winning fight. The, winning the interim title. This Great weekend, fight. amazing fight. The card was amazing. My hats uh, off to Chad Mendes though for taking that fight on such short two weeks' notice. notice. You know what I mean? He two didn't have a full notice. training camp, so that might have affected the outcome. It, it may have. It's a great fight. Uh, a, a big round of applause also too for Rory McDonald and Robbie Lawler. At a war, folks. Even if you're not into MMA, if you want to look and, and try to catch a clip of that fight, it's brutal. These two men went to 
war. Yeah. So my hat's off to everybody who participated in that. I hope everybody's having a great day. For all you listeners, I hope y'all have a wonderful week. I hope you don't work too hard. Don't nobody get too cold. Don't nobody get too hot. If you're into more thylacine stuff, too, uh, our buddies down there in Australia, uh, Waz and Chris, they have a, they're starting a podcast, and they actually have the true, the TRU. If you go to their website, uh, you can actually look, but it's on YouTube right now. But they've got, I think, three or four episodes up yep. uh-huh. of the podcast. You can go and you can listen to what they've been up to and the research that they've been doing and all that stuff, which is really fun. I mean, I'm, I'm down for everybody to have a podcast. It's fun. Yeah, and I mean, and just like we have mentioned before, you can go on their website and you can actually donate to those game cameras and mm-hmm. help out the team. That's mm-hmm. really cool if you want to be – Become a cryptozoologist. Uh, there's your chance. You can help uh, support them in the search for this thing. That's right. Pretty interesting stuff. Don't forget, folks, if you have stories of your own or things you'd like to share, you can always email the show, expandedperspectives at yahoo.com. You can call the show. You can leave us a message about uh, why you like Expanded Perspectives. You can leave a message why uh, others should join. You should. You can leave messages of your own experiences if you prefer to call in rather than type it out. Cause right. Nobody likes typing, especially if you're a single finger typer. That's me. You just peck away <laughs> one finger at a time. <laughs> you can call the show, Cam. That number's 817-945-3828. Uh, is there anything else? You can follow the show, uh, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. You know the deal. Yeah. We're pretty easy to find. Yeah, we're real easy to find. We're going to be periscoping again like we always talk about. And, and if you follow on Instagram, we try to post the books. Oh, a week or so before we do the before we release the interviews, we have pictures of the books that come out, stuff like that. So, yep. and if you like expanded perspectives, don't forget if you're not an elite member, you can join now. You can go to the website expandedperspectives.com. There is something like 48, 49 episodes back there that you have not listened to unless you're an elite member. Mm-hmm. It's a complete back catalog, and you can get access to all of it for five dollars. So that's right. you're paying like ten cents an episode. So that's it, folks. Have a good week. Be careful. We'll talk to you next time. For those leaders, we'll speak to you Thursday. Peace.